In this video, we're going to talk about the definite integral. Recall that in a previous video, we talked about the area problem, where we developed a method for calculating the area under a curve. What we would do is take our interval, in this case from 1 to 3, and break that up into equal subintervals. In this case, we chose four rectangles. And so we have four subintervals. All of them have the same length, which is 0 0.5. Then for each uh, subinterval, we chose a height of our rectangle. And in this case, we chose the left endpoint to be the height. We could have also chosen the right endpoint, or we could have chosen the midpoint which would actually give us the most accurate approximation. But in any case, we're not really interested in getting the best approximation, excuse me, an accurate approximation, because the best approximation, well, we can improve our approximation by taking more rectangles. And uh, so for example, if I take 10 rectangles, they'll all be skinnier, which means I have a smaller delta x we have more of these subintervals. But our best approximation is found by using infinitely many rectangles, which uh, means we're taking a limit as n goes to infinity. So for the definite integral, we're going to use the same idea as we did with the area problem, but with any function, not just functions which lie above whose graph lies above the x-axis. So the definition is a little bit long, but it just simply describes mostly the procedure that we use, but just for any function which is defined on the closed interval a comma b. We're going to take our a comma b, divide it up into n subintervals, and remember that we uh, labeled the endpoints of the intervals with x with a subscript. So the first subinterval is x sub 0 to x sub 1. The second subinterval is x sub 1 to x sub 2, and so on. Each of those subintervals have the same length, which we can calculate as delta x equals b minus a over n. Recall that the first uh, x our first left endpoint x sub 0 is a, and the last right endpoint x sub n equals b. And we have a formula for calculating the right endpoint, the right end, the ith right endpoint x sub i is a plus i times delta x. So that we saw with the area problem. Now here we have a difference. Instead of choosing the left endpoint or the right endpoint or maybe the midpoint, we're going to choose some sample point. It could be the left endpoint. It could be the right endpoint. It could be the midpoint. It's just some number in the interval from x sub i minus 1 and x sub i. Could be the left endpoint x sub i minus 1 could be the right endpoint, x sub i, could be any number in between. So then we define the definite integral, the definite integral of f from a to b as the limit as n goes to infinity, summation i equals 1 to n, f evaluated at the sample point x sub i star times delta x. And the way we write that is with this funny looking s. We put a at the bottom of the s, b at the top of the s. So we have a subscript and a superscript on the s, f of x dx. Now, this definite integral exists only when this limit exists and always gives us the same number no matter how we choose the sample points, the x 
sub i star. So if we have a portion of the graph which lies above the x-axis, so f of x is positive on a to b, then this is exactly the same situation as we had with the area problem. And so in this graph shown here, the integral from negative 1 to 3 of f of x dx is exactly this shaded area, the area between the curve and uh, the x-axis from negative 1 to positive 3. However, if f of x is not positive on the interval, then the integral represents something called the signed area, which would be the area above the x-axis subtracting the area below the x-axis. So in other words, we consider the area of the, which is, lies above the x-axis as positive, the area which lies below as negative. So if I were to try to find the definite integral from negative 1 to positive 5, well, part of the graph is above the x-axis, like in the previous example. But the other part is below the x-axis. So the value of the definite integral would be the area, a sub 1, which lies above the x-axis, minus the area, a sub 2, which lies below the x-axis. If the portion of the graph only lies under uh, the x-axis, then the value of the definite integral will be negative. It's going to be the negative of that area, which is entirely below the x-axis. And if I look at a function with some symmetry, so for example, here I have the graph of the sine function, then due to symmetry, I know that the area above is exactly the same as the area below the x-axis. So in my shaded red shaded part, a sub 1, is exactly the, the same in area as the a sub 2, which would mean if I take the definite integral from negative pi to positive pi of sine of x dx, that's just going to be a sub 1, minus a sub 2, which is 0. So this tells me that the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx may be negative, it may be positive, or it may be 0, depending upon the function and depending upon the a and the b value. So let's you uh, start using some proper terminology for the definite integral. Uh, we already talked about the integral sign. It is a, a funny looking S and it's because it reminds us of a sum. The de definition is the limit of a sum. The function is called the integrand. What you're taking the integral of is called the integrand. The endpoints of the closed interval are called the limits of integration or the bounds of integration. I'll try to use the word bounds of integration, but I always uh, learned as a student to say limits of integration. So I may use either term. The A, the, which is the subscript, is called the lower bound or lower limit. And B is the upper bound or the upper limit of integration.
this ending part, the dx, is very important and it's easy to forget it. You may have to write yourself a little reminder uh, when you're taking a quiz or a test you know, to, to write down that dx or whatever the appropriate integrand, I mean, a differential is. Uh, because the this differential dx tells us two things. Uh, you have to include it or the, the integral doesn't make sense. The first thing it tells us is what the variable of integration is. So if it says dx, that means we are integrating with respect to x. And then the second thing it tells us is where the integrand ends. So let's look at a couple examples to say to see what I mean. If my integrand has a formula with many letters in it, so mx plus b, um, which one of those letters is my variable? Which one of those letters is the variable for integration? Well, if I write the integral from negative 3 to 4 of mx plus b dx, I'm going to take the integral with respect to x. If I write the integral from negative 3 to 4 mx plus b db, then I'm going to treat b as the variable, and the x is going to be considered a constant. Also, if I look at the integral from negative 3 to 4 mx plus b dx versus the integral from negative 3 to 4 mx dx plus b, those are very different. In the first one, b is part of the integrand, and in the second one, b is outside the integrand. And so we, in the second one, we would evaluate the integral with just the mx then afterwards, we would just add the number b, as opposed to the first one, b is part of the integrand. So we have two different integrands, and the dx is telling us where the integrand ends. The sum that we see in either the area problem or the uh, definite definition of the definite integral is called a Riemann sum. It's named in honor of Bernhard Riemann. And the reason why it's important that we learn this terminology about Riemann sum is that if you can take a quantity such as area or volume or the physical notion of work, if you can estimate it using a Riemann sum, then you can usually calculate the exact value using a definite integral. Now I say usually because not all functions are integrable. In other words, that limit of a sum may not exist, or it may be different depending upon how you choose the sample values. But if you have a function which is continuous on your closed interval, except maybe a few points where you have jump discontinuities or removable discontinuities, then that function will be integrable on a comma b. So most of the common functions that we see uh, would be uh, integrable on a closed interval. So let's look at some examples. And the first one, we're given the limit of a sum. So we are given a Riemann sum. And uh, we'd like to write that as a definite integral. So we can see in this summation what the function value is. Right? We have kind of the, the, the integrand is going to be uh, within the sum before you get to the delta x. So in this case, our integrand is going to be x times radical 1 plus x cubed. And 
uh, we're given the closed interval, so we know our values of A and B. And we know that we're going to differentiate with respect to X. So as an integral, it would be the definite integral from 2 to 5 X radical 1 plus X cubed DX. Our second example is going to take a few more steps because what we're going to do is actually evaluate the definite integral, which means we'll have to write it as the limit of a sum and then evaluate it. So our integrand is x squared minus 2x. So the function is f of x equals x squared minus 2x. The bounds of integration are 1 and 3. So our a value is 1. Our b value is 3. Delta x then is going to be 3 minus 1 over n, which simplifies to 2 over n. And our formula for the right endpoint, x sub i, is going to be a plus i times delta x, which will be 1 plus 2i over n, if I replace delta x with 2 over n. And as a note, using the right endpoint is always going to be the simplest choice. And so uh, since f of x is continuous, we know that the uh, definite integral exists, and we can choose uh, our x sub i star to be the most convenient value and so we're going to have x sub i star. To be the right endpoint, which is x sub i. That is the simplest, most convenient sample point to use. So then we're going to calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum. And so uh, just replacing f of x sub i with x sub i squared minus 2xi. I'm just using the formula for f of x there. And now I'm going to replace x sub i with my 1 plus 2i over n. So I'm going to get the limit as n goes to infinity, summation i equals 1 to n, first in parentheses 1 plus 2i squared, that's my x sub i squared, minus 2 parentheses 1 plus 2i over n, that's my minus 2x sub i, and then I still need the delta x, but I'll replace delta x with 2 over n. So then let me just start to multiply this out. I'm going to use FOIL with 1 plus 2i over n squared. I get 1 plus 4i over n plus 4i squared over n squared. And just as a reminder, what I'm doing here is I'm using the formula that a plus b capital A plus capital B squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And so uh, A is my 1, so I'll have 1 squared plus 2 times 1. B is my 2I over N, so 2I over N plus quantity 2i over n squared. So that's how I got 1, and then the middle term, 4i over n, and then the last term will be 4i squared over n squared after I multiply it out. Uh, and then I'll just use the distributive property. I'll get a negative 2 and then a minus 4i over n. And that is in brackets and still multiplied by 2 over n. And uh, here's a, a, a nice simplification. The 4i over n 
uh, adds to make zero. I have four i over n minus four i over n. That's going to be zero. And then collecting the like terms, one minus two will give me a negative one. Now what's left over then, I can break up into two sums. I'll have in the first sum, I'll just use the distributive property with the four i squared over n squared, multiply that times two over n. And I'm gonna get the sum as i equals one to n of eight i squared over n cubed. Now, in this sum, the eight and the n cubed do not change as i changes. i is the only thing that's changing here, so I can factor out the eight over n cubed. And I'm left with the summation i equals one to n of i squared. And back when we saw the area problem, we said we had some identities for these summations. And so the summation i equals one to n of i squared is the formula n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six. So I'll use that formula there. I'll multiply out the formula inside the brackets and then use the distributive property. Oh, I did a simplification first. I saw that uh, eight and six have a common factor of two, then use the distributive property and simplify each one of those terms. So I'm left with three fractions, eight thirds plus four over n plus four over three n squared. The second sum is uh, easier. We're just going to multiply negative one times two over n. And in fact, uh, I'm just going to remember to do a subtraction. So I'm just going to multiply one times two over n and get the summation i equals one to n two over n. Um, and in fact, the two over n is just a constant with respect to i. So I could really write that as two over n times the summation i equals one to n of one. And if I go back to our identities, I'm just adding up n copies of one, so I'm just going to get n. And so that is going to give me 2 over n times n, which of course is just 2. So the last thing is to take the limit. So I've calculated now the sum here, this whole sum I've calculated in two parts. So I'll have to bring both of those parts together. So I'll have the limit as n goes to infinity, eight thirds plus four over n plus four over three n squared and Remember as n goes to infinity that the four over n goes to zero, the four over three n squared goes to zero. And so I'll be left with eight thirds minus two, which equals two thirds. So I'll make another video uh, with some more examples where we use this technique. But we're going to learn that uh, and this uh, technique is only really viable for simple polynomials with small degrees. So we need to find a better method. And we will have a better method when we learn about the fundamental theorem of calculus.